Okay, well, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Professor Janet Treasure, who's uh, agreed to talk to me very nicely. Um, she's one of the, the uh, senior editors in a, in a new book that's coming out where I'm the, the, the chief editor. It's called um, Eating Disorders, a Comprehensive International Perspective. And it's, by, it's published by Springer. And it should be um, out um, probably early next year. I think it's going to be pretty big. Uh, but I thought we'd talk to Janet and just find out a little bit more about her and eating disorders. So the first question I had for you, Janet, was um, what brought you into the field? What got you interested? Mm. Well, it's rather strange. I mean, when you look at a retrospective of your life, it looks as though there's a causal pathway, although you don't see it at the time. But when mm. I was at uh, my grammar school, and I think sort of in the fifth form or something, there was a, a, a young girl in our class who'd just come from somewhere up north to join us. And then she developed, you know, this strange illness that none of us knew anything about. And she had to leave school and things. And then in hindsight, that was anorexia. Um, but, it, you know, it was all rather strange at that time. Then I decided to do medicine and psychiatry, and I, I got the prize for psychiatry, uh, and, uh, and you had to fill in an exam, mm. and the exam question was describing anorexia nervosa, which I, I didn't really know that much about, but I thought, oh, this is quite good. You can make it up in, by first principles, you know, knowing the starvation on different body organs, you can work out what the symptoms are. So I completed this essay and I got the prize for psychiatry, oh. and I ended up starting to train in psychiatry after I did uh, my mm -hmm. two foundation years, as they're called now. Um, uh, meanwhile, a medical student peer had anorexia nervosa as well. So I had a, a, another contact with the illness then. And I did a, a PhD on the hypothalamus and pituitary axis and stress, etc. And of course, the hypothalamus is very much related to food and eating uh, and yeah. so it sort of felt in that area and then I went to America after doing my physician's jobs and then came back and decided I'd do psychiatry and I, I wrote to the Maudsley Hospital which was of just a few streets away from where I lived and that was quite important because I just had a baby <laughs> and you know I, I didn't want too much commuting uh, to take up time and I'd planned to come back straight after coming from America to go in the to enter in the September uh, but then I got a phone call in the February saying would you mind doing a locum um, and starting earlier in the February and I phoned up my mother-in-law who said she was very happy to come down and look after the baby. And then I joined you, Paul, mm. in, in Gerald Russell's team. And, and then I never oh, really God. left. <laughs> so lots yeah. of chance yeah. encounters, really. But it, it all looks highly yeah. planned, but it wasn't. <laughs> it, it does a, a sort of succession of happy accidents. Yes. We're not, we're not so happy if you're the patient. No. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, that's very interesting. And the, what would you say the, the key stages uh, in your career and the sort of people who influence you? I can imagine. Well, of but, course, uh, it was, you know, uh, joining uh, Professor Russell's team with you involved and, and a, a number of people involved in this exciting research, wasn't it? With looking at the mm. impact of family uh, based treatment or what we called at the term Maudsley family therapy on the outcome of people admitted to hospital. So it, I was introduced to an academic network and that was fun. And it was an area that I, because I'd done endocrine and the control of the brain, it, it sort of fitted into my skill set, really. Uh, and so, mm. yes, I remember Gerald Russell getting particularly interested in people who developed pre-monarchal uh, anorexia nervosa and he was writing up a paper on that and so uh, that, that you know I remember he, he was interested in one particular aspect that I followed up and so obviously you know showed him that I was interested in the area and then he was able to encourage my yeah. career.
Yeah, yeah. And I noticed that you, you got physician training, didn't you? Yes, you, you like you. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, well, we a few of us did in those days. Yeah. Um, so what? how did that go? What? what uh, were you planning to be a physician or well, did you... Uh... I, was in, I was interested in that, um, but... Um, I was married to a surgeon and, and of course they are working nights and emergency call and whatever. And as a physician as well, you have a very unregulated, well, in those days, but still mm -hmm. unregulated hours, etc. And so in terms of a speciality, psychiatry very much sort of tempted me really as, as something yeah. that could combine yeah. and where I lived, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> a few blocks from the yeah. hospital. <laughs> um, yes, well, yes, you could have gone to King's as well. Yes, <laughs> yes, of course. So that would have been across the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you said you went to America. Well, what was that? Was that just a holiday or was it No, no, that was in America for a year because my husband was a cardiac surgeon and in Birmingham, Alabama, there was a specialist centre which had many foreign fellows and so I went and in fact I worked in a renal team there and I was giving rats sort of different oh. foods to see the effect on their blood pressure and things and, and that's what I did there right. yeah yeah well, which, which really center, can anyway. you say which center that was sorry in, the, in Birmingham Alabama Alabama, all right, That's it, the deep south okay yes yeah all right and uh, if you think about your own career what are the things you feel that you've been involved in which which you feel uh, proud of and, and which which you think have made a difference well i think the, the core the core thing that i've been able to do um you know again looking with hindsight is to work with people with lived experience and and i've uh -huh. written books with them and uh developed treatments with them and that and and also you know carers have funded some of my research in the early days and that has been really wonderful uh to deal with because as you know research funding for anorexia nervosa hasn't been very forthcoming and people had very mixed views about it I, I was lucky enough to do uh, an early genetic study well looking at twins well, with eating disorders, mm. which showed that genetic factors were involved with Tony Holland. Um, but it was very, I, rem I remember when we talked to, went to meetings to talk about it, I almost thought we were going to have eggs thrown at us because the, the, the view of eating disorders at that time was very much social uh, and thinking of biological factors was very not in fashion. Um, but the carers were very interested in looking at genetics and the brain, you know, that, that they felt these biological factors must be involved. And so they were able to give seed, you know, get, give seed corn resources to start these things going. Um, so I had somebody who did all these cycle things that gave us money to start uh, looking at brain scans, which we did some of the earliest work on brain scannings, and then some of the earliest genetic work and starting, it was with David Collier in the first instance, and then that um, has built to, you know, the very large twin studies we're doing at the moment, sort of edgy and glad, which have yeah. done the GWAS studies. So, and but I think that that was very much primed by by carers who who gave the money. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, this working uh, with people with lived experience, very lucky being able to teach, uh, so, you know, medical students and psychiatrists, and I would teach them about, you know, give the, uh, give a module on eating disorders. And of course, people who'd mm -hmm. had an eating disorder tended to go to that uh, module not that i advertised but they 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 were interested and that's led to some fruitful collaborations and writing books together and i think that is a wonderful partnership you know to have both the lived experience and the the sort of scientific experience uh and in combined because i think that that gives wonderful insight and uh, uh makes great teaching and re reading yeah. 
I mean, it feels to me as though you, you've broken down a barrier uh, between the profession and, and the, well, particularly the carers, if not the patient, the sufferers as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's uh, that has been a barrier? Well, I, I, luckily, I don't think we in our field have ever perhaps had such a barrier. I know in other branches of psychiatry, sometimes there is antagonism, isn't there, between professionals and, mm. and the patient group. But luckily, we haven't had that, I don't think, that, uh, that there is this collaborative uh, partnership. But yes, I think that I, I was probably... I, I sort of looking back a bit ahead of the time, because as you know, Paul, it's it's very much what we're advised to do uh, by both mm. research and service departments working with uh, people with lived experience to design our where we're going to research and to design our services. So it's yeah, very yeah. much. But but I was in the lucky you know, writing books early on about, you know, I wrote one, the, the skills based training, which was for for. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, pet parents um, with a with a carer and uh, somebody who's recovered from the eating disorder herself. So it gave that very three dimensional perspective. Yeah. And, and yeah. of course, I wrote a, a, I wrote another paper describing inpatient stays and thinking. So I, with a group of people who'd had lived experience of inpatient care and. Um, psychological or psychiatric expertise or medical expertise and we think thought about how things could go wrong on inpatient units um that you mm. know that there were often were stresses and strains that perhaps were not uh conducive to a good recovery uh and you know, I, we very much, as you know, at the Maudsley, we were very much trained thinking about expressed emotion and family-based uh, treatment yeah. of expressed yeah. emotion. So we were thinking of the expressed emotion that can occur on inpatient units, how people can either become overprotective, uh, walking on eggshells about a patient, or they can just get rather frustrated and irritated and when it comes out as anger. Mm. Um, uh, and so realizing that what happened on the ward was exactly what happened at home. And wouldn't it be a good idea yeah. if we could uh, help people at home how to manage dealing with these expressed emotions uh, one mm. thing, this tendency to be swinging from overprotection to um, uh, yeah. anger and fragmenting the family because of different versions um, mm. but also um, we were interested in in working with people whose motivation was very mixed. They might only have a tiny yeah. flicker of wanting to give up the anorexia that the patients and the parents had a 10 out of 10. Um, mm -hmm. And also the, the patients had an ability, thinking how could they, of about zero. Um, and yes, yeah. everybody else thought, well, why can't you just eat, you know? Uh, and so this, mm -hmm. this, how you work with people who aren't very motivated or just don't feel they can move on. Uh, and that, mm. you know, because just trying to fix it, be a Mr. Fix It, oh, you just do that, just eat, <laughs> which is true, just eat. Yes. Uh, but if only I think it doesn't work always. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. And thinking yeah. about how you yeah. handle Can that. I just go back to this, uh, this question? Yes. Sorry, Janet. Can I yes, just go sorry. back to this question of this? Oh, the staff uh, attitude to, yeah. to patients, which yeah. I think is crucial. Yeah. And uh, it reminds me of stories I've had from um, patients and carers who've gone to primary care, who've gone to the emergency department, who've gone to anywhere really in, um, in healthcare and not had a great experience. Yeah. And I wonder uh, whether you had some thoughts about that, because it does seem to link to what you were saying about the yes. ward. Yes. 
Well, I, I think that that's right. Well, the first step often is that patients, the core symptoms of the eating disorder, the patients don't really regard as symptoms, do they? They don't. Mm -hmm. That was a classical thing that Lasseg noticed. They, they, they say, I do not suffer. Therefore, I'm well, you know, they don't complain of feeling mm. tired and languid, which most people, when they're starving, feel not very well. So that's a bit of a strange factor that we wonder what causes that. Um, mm. But but also, now I can't even think what my main bit was going to be asking to say. I'm I was sorry. asking about the, the yeah. staff attitudes. They're not, not very positive sometimes. Yes. So that, that causes great difficulty when, and, and so many patients, when they come to primary care, they don't mention or start on the wood. They don't see those eating things as problems, the, the loss of weight, that they seem solutions. Whereas yeah. they might come to a GP with a bit of depression, well, depression and anxiety, uh, and sometimes get rooted that way or, you know, not having periods and rooted that way. And so there can be long gaps before the eating disorder is thought about. And mm. as we were saying, sometimes the eating disorder produces positive benefits, what are seen as positive benefits in the short term, but which in the long term uh, cause problems, such as they mm. might dampen down emotions you know when you're quite starving you don't feel the intensity of mixed emotions that may have yeah. been part yeah. of the trigger and so that seems like a solution and you don't want to give it up and mm. when we ask people um you know what are the benefits of anorexia so we got them to write a letter to their friend and anorexia the foe they were able to come up with quite a, a mm. big paragraph uh, and, and parents as well see how they see how they can get benefits. And sometimes it's more intention from parents and that sort of thing. And uh, so it, it can mm. produce secondary social effects as well as the internal medical and psychological effects. So those are the things yeah. that make it rather yeah. difficult. Uh, but, but have I come back to the once you get onto a specialist unit, you've got nurses who should be more trained in understanding the eating disorder. But because there's this ambivalence uh, that they, they don't want to gain weight and, uh, uh, and that that's a nurse's job, this can cause a lot of friction. Uh, and it yeah. takes a great deal of patience and compassion to work with such patients. Yeah. And, and yeah. perhaps we haven't focused enough on the managing the anxiety of eating, uh, which is, is, is there as well, I would say. Are you talking about for the patients or is this for the staff as well? I mean, <laughs> but, <laughs> I think, but yeah. I mean, we have, that's why we wrote the book for carers because we've tried to give them tips about how to support. But we know that for a lot of anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders, exposure treatment is, very useful mm -hmm. that's where mm -hmm. you have to think about the consequences an eating disorder it's often not the immediate consequences it's the consequences in the future you know weight gain but it's not just the weight gain it's the impact of weight gain if i'm fat people yeah, nobody yeah. will love me anymore i'll be alienated and stigmatized mm -hmm. that sort of thing um, yeah. And and so we haven't really. There's been some a few studies using exposure, but exposure treatment has advanced, and particularly with um, virtual reality, that might make yeah. exposure even easier because it's sort of getting lots of different types of food that you've got to gradually expose people to and get them to think about mm. it is a bit it's do doable but it it's it takes time and effort whereas virtual yeah. programs yeah. might but i mean mm. early days yet yeah and talking about exposure makes me think that some say proportional of course we don't quite know how many uh, patients with eating disorders have a trauma history yes. and um mm -hmm. you know how should we approach that because um maybe there's a danger that taking away the eating disorder too rapidly like refeeding mm. 
might um, expose them to something really bad. What yeah. do you think from your experience? Well, I, I think that that that's possible. And what we do know is that we have to do a careful what we call in psychiatry a formulation where we try to mm. unpick all the many causes and we now are much better have a much better understanding of, of the variety of causes so we, mm. for instance we now know that there are genetic causes and that those genetic causes are somehow a sensitivity to some forms of particularly anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder so they they seem mm. to be in the mix but also what has been very surprising uh that's the there's a metabolic element so people prone to get anorexia nervosa tend to have leanness in their families their own personal history uh and uh, have the counter to what we call metabolic syndrome they have low levels of cholesterol and if they have any cholesterol it's a good cholesterol uh, and and their insulin sensitivity is very good so um they have that metabolic profile and it appears that people with bulimia nervosa and binge eating have the opposite genetic profile in that they they have more oh. overweight in the family um, and they seem to have those markers of metabolism that are the opposite of anorexia nervosa so both yeah. all forms of anorexia are a little bit of psychiatric and a little bit of somatic so psychosomatic mm. illnesses that's one yes. background factor that might uh, increase the vulnerability not always we see about 18 percent have a family history or perhaps it's a bit fewer that's in inpatients mm -hmm. it's perhaps fewer in outpatients um, but then as you say it's and then that those vulnerabilities might build, build a sensitivity to a certain sort of emotional processing and then if a trauma does occur you know it might be less easy to to manage that uh, and, and that yeah. might be really to disentangle. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I mean, do, do, do you think there's a social aspect to it? Do you think there's a, the, to the etiology? Because uh, No doubt. I mean, I think the public image is that it's all about models and, uh, yes, you know, yes. and thin ideal. Yes. Uh, I just wonder where that fits. Well, I, I think I think that, that that's there. That's one aspect is the 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 environment, the the weight and shape environment and in fact for men it's not that it's the opposite to be you know honed and toned or whatever <laughs> um yeah. but uh, rather than being thin um and so we see eating disorders are more like that in males um but also uh, we have to think about the food environment uh, and if we think of the food environment mm. which it, it does has at the moment encouraged such a an increase in obesity uh, and so that builds both public awareness and uh, public health trying to reduce that so that uh, makes dieting uh, much more salient uh, and so uh, that's another factor and so what do we, what about the food environment what is it and I think we're getting a bit nearer that at the moment aren't we uh, these interesting studies showing how um, uh, highly processed foods are very much implicated in really uh, uh, impacting on our appetite system such that we we overeat and gain weight and, and almost as if we're not getting the correct balance of nutrients so oh. we're sort of eating in order to get enough of the nutrients and so that's being implicated it's not been it's not been one time it was all fat and sugar but now it's gone to these you know what food technologies produce that that uh, oh. are added to food to make them have a longer shelf life sit in plastic yeah. for yeah. months at a time Okay, well, this is really fascinating. I'm exhausted Thank you, you, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can we just talk a little bit, just for a few minutes, about what your thoughts about the future are in terms of the field? About what, what do you think we should put our limited resources into uh, studying? 
Well, I think we've come quite a long way in being able to do the first line approaches, the how to teach carers and, 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 and how to do those first steps. So early interventions are the best so far, and that's whether they're mm -hmm. in adult or uh, child and adolescent services. But what we don't know very much about, and we do so poorly, is for those who unfortunately have a more severe and complex presentation, uh, which lasts for longer or needs uh, inpatient treatment. And we are appallingly bad at those because what we know is about 40% have repeated admissions. So over half of the admissions coming into hospital are repeat admissions. So, you know, the inpatient treatment doesn't work um and we we people are left with a long severe illness uh, and we haven't um got the results so that's where new treatments need to be focused and yeah, and there yeah. are interesting ideas lots of interesting ideas so we think about other branches of psychiatry we know there's this psychiatric vulnerability and we know that different treatments, drug treatments now do work for people who are resistant to nor, you know, the base, the, the standard uh, drug treatments for depression and OCD. So I'm thinking of things like the psychedelics. So there's great interest in ketamine yeah. and psilocybin. So they might have an effect. Similarly, another branch of psychiatry working with these non-treatment responding uh, our neuromodulation, TMS uh, um, treatments. So there's some work by my colleague Ulrika Schmidt that shows that these might have some potential. Yeah. And yeah. yet another, go, going back to the endocrine story of anorexia that comes and goes and comes and goes, a, mm. a colleague in Germany has done some work which is a very paradoxical thing, which is giving leptin, which is a hormone produced by in fat cells and makes you stop eating. Mm. And there, there's a, a new, uh, you know, uh, technologically produced metrolep. It's called metroleptin, uh, which has the same effect. Okay. And that's, that sounds a bit worrying. So giving something that stops people eating. But what it also does is stop all the starvation features. So it stops people being overactive, which some people with anorexia are. Mm. It um, mm. improves their mood um, uh, and, um, and, and sort of has these, improves their sleep. And so it has a lot of positive benefits. It doesn't do that much to eating, it doesn't make it fall down more, but so many of these mm. other aspects of the eating disorder that, uh, are very troubling and, and reduce motivation or reduce. So there's work in Germany starting that and we, we are thinking if we might try that. Similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, there's, you know, these new, these new work of sort of um, lyoglutamide for treatment of obesity and diabetes. And there's a lot of interest uh, in whether that will now be helpful in obesity and we know that um uh <laughs> binge eating disorder is often complicated by obesity and so there's rationale for using that in this yeah. condition as well yeah and we know yeah. that that you know yeah. this, this treatment is you know spreading widely because it is very active on reducing yeah. weight and reducing appetite yeah and on the psychological and family side, do you think there's any any progress we can make? Well, I, I think I think there has been progress. I don't know whether there's mm -hmm. a, a much bigger gap. The thing, you know, we talked about. You have to think about um, uh, expressed emotion, but another feature I have been aware of, when particularly through looking at other areas of psychiatry, looking at treatment of anxiety in childhood and treatment of obsessive compulsive is the road, role of accommodation. And this is where mm -hmm. that you can um, have a, 
an, it's an automatic nurturing response to seeing a, an offspring yeah. who's anxious is to over to protect them and to uh, try and reassure them and and take away the source of their anxiety so it's a very natural reaction um, but unfortunately it allows the eating disorder to persist uh, and so um, oh, yes. Uh, that that can so easily develop and it, it can be I was just hearing a tale today you know one girl in a family refused to let her parents use the fridge for anything uh, mm. so she all her foods were in the fridge so theirs were left out and theirs sort of deteriorated went a bit moldy but they were ending up eating those because you know they couldn't use the fresher foods in the fridge um, because wow. those were hers. So there's all you hear, and you know, in every case, you do hear a different course of accommodation. Uh, and they, they, and it's step by step, these sort of behaviors develop and are very difficult to yeah. shift. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so it's understandable how they develop. Mm, yeah. yeah.